Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, there's always a little bit of uncomfortable truth in the most unsettling pieces of fiction, and if if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you're in the seats with once more, as always. My name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide ranging variety of industry professionals and pick their brains about current projects, state of the business, how they got started, and well, anything else we can think of in a in a light and conversational fashion. And if you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, and, and God knows we hope that you do, because you are listening to it right now, but you can do so over at Spotify, over at Apple, or you can find every single one of our episodes archived over at our YouTube channel. Also, We'd really appreciate it if you uh, checked us out over at social media for all sorts of updates. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at either at In The Seats or at It's Podcast One. And finally, and as I always say, most importantly, please visit us over at In The Seats, intheseats.ca for all sorts of movie news, reviews, lists, and info from the world of cinema, the world of television, and a little bit of be- a little bit beyond from every corner of the planet that we can pull it from, because that's what our hard-working crew loves to do. On today's episode, uh, we got a good one, because we're talking with writer-director Jordan Graham about his new film, Seder, which is uh, available on VOD platforms now, and it's, it's really this creepy, but, and, well, not but, but creepy and a really unsettling a uh, piece of horror that kind of pulls from elements of fiction, but also elements of real life and sort of plays with issues of dementia that come into families. And it's it's a, it's a DIY la- labor of love, love <laughs> that Jordan made himself over the course of several years. And it's a, it's a beautiful film to watch, but it's really, it's one of those ones that gets under your skin, too, and I do recommend you check it out if uh, if you are of that ilk. It had a great uh, festival run at places like Fantasia and a few other places, and uh, we talked with Jordan just about the inspiration for the film and sort of the trials and tribulations of getting it made, and uh, it was a fun talk, and uh, I hope you uh, I hope you enjoy it, and we definitely recommend that you go check out Seder, because it is a... It's a film that's really gonna seep in with you once you, once you sort of let yourself get into that kind of mood. It's 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 that kind of film that it's not necessarily gonna scare you, but it's gonna it's gonna unsettle you. I think that's the best way to sell it. And uh, I hope you enjoy our talk. How are you doing? I'm good, man. Good. I mean, I'm just I'm you know I'm thankful for the time to talk about the movie because I mean I, yeah. I will be honest, man. I, I dug the hell out of it. I Good. really enjoyed it. And I mean, I'm kind of curious because I think this is the primary thing that I love about a film like Seder. It, it, it kind of mm-hmm. plays, it doesn't play in the reveal. It plays in the darkness. It plays in those sort of, those little creepy noises that we can almost kind of yeah. hear uh, rather than trying to hit the audience over the head with it. And I'm like, walk me through sort of the inspiration for the story. Well, I mean, that it felt like you went from like a inspiration to noise and to the story. Do you want to know the information, like inspiration of why, like I wanted to have that like atmosphere and that mood? Give it and, all to me. Give it all to uh, me. So that one was kind of, uh, I mean, the Blair Witch. So like, uh, I, uh, I'm a huge fan of the Blair Witch Project, and one aspect with that is how when you hear um, noises in that that film. Like it actually sounds like it's off in the distance, yeah. Right, like when you're hearing, uh, like the rocks fall and the, the twigs snap, and that every time I watch that movie, when it's late at night, it creeps me out just because those sound effects actually sound like they're they're out there. And uh, when a lot of horror movies, it's all like like um, you could tell it's recorded in a studio, right. and even the new Blair Witch movie was. I was all that it was all like like uh um artificial or like it just felt like it was made in a in a studio so I wanted to uh uh go in this like with those sound effects I want to make sure I'm out there deep into the woods and um and getting those sound effects to make it seem like it's uh 
it's distant and actually distant. And uh, so anyways, that was the inspiration as far as uh, that mood and whatnot. Um, but story, now if we go into story, um, I guess the biggest, the biggest one was uh, my, uh, my grandmother. Mm. Um, and because she wasn't even supposed to be a part of this film. And uh, when I decided to use her house as a location, I was gonna put her in the film as a quick cameo. And um, she just, it was gonna be an improvisational thing. And she started bringing up the voices in her head and, and something called automatic writing, which I've never heard about before. And I thought that was it, like really fascinating and unique. And that changed the whole, the whole film for me. Cause then after that, I had to figure out how to uh, incorporate my grandmother's uh, story into the story that I was already making this fictional story I was already right. making. Yeah. So that's no, I mean, like, yeah, that's fascinating just in terms of trying to get something that, I mean, it's, this sounds like it was something that you didn't expect. It was something that almost like it just kind of happened and you're, and you're marrying it to sort of this piece of fiction and, I'm kind of curious, like, how do you sort of manage to walk that line and, and blend the two? Because, I mean, I can imagine on one end, you would have a story that you want to tell, but then you would have this thing that would happen with your grandmother and be like, yeah, I can't drop this. I got to work it in. Like, how do you sort of resolve the two to sort of make them? Well, the first, one, the first one, uh, like the first story that I had, I don't really remember a whole lot of it, but I know it wasn't like anything special. Right. Uh, so, uh, cause I was talking with a different sales agent then, and he was like, you need to make a, like a creature feature. And it's like, I don't really want to make that, but, um, okay. And so, uh, I was, I was starting to make something that wasn't, wasn't very personal at all. And, or I probably, if I made that story, I imagine we wouldn't be even having this, these conversations, right? Uh, but, uh, um, so yeah so then when my grandmother stuff came in yes i i mean i knew i had something that was very unique and very interesting and personal it definitely it changed who i like as a filmmaker and how i want to uh write i will never be able to write pers stories that are this personal because that was just a kind of a fluke but i want to write things that are very important to me or things that really get to me but uh, but what you're saying with like a, we, how I, weaving it together and, and drawing that line, um, just I took a lot of breaks. Um, uh, luckily, I didn't have a schedule on this film and I financed it basically myself. Uh, and so I had all the time in the world to to create it. So when we uh, whenever I would shoot with my grandmother, uh, doing like improvisational stuff, I would take week long breaks and rewrite and try figuring out how to, to make it work. And it did it. That was one of the most difficult aspects of this film mentally was trying to make it work with the story that I was already telling because you can't, like, I can try predicting what my grandmother is going to say, but it doesn't ever work. And, uh, and you have no idea what she's going to say. And so a lot of the stuff that she was saying wasn't working at all with the story that I was trying to tell. Um, and then like, even at the end that there's the scene with, uh, with Deborah and Nani talking. And I wrote this whole huge monologue out for, for uh, Deborah to say, just so I can get story stuff across. But then my grandmother completely stole the show. And, but I had a, uh, and like, it was just, it was amazing what she was talking about. And it's like, I don't, I have no idea how this is going to work in the film. So it just, yeah, it took, a, it took a lot of trying to figure out how to, um, how to get it to work and have it make sense and make sense for me. Like, yes, a lot of things are vague, but everything to, to me makes sense. So. Um. No, and that's no, and there's nothing wrong with that. Cause I mean, I mean, it's your vision, it's your story, and it's the it's the kind of thing you want to tell. And I do love how sort of the fictional moments are framed with the more black and white family stuff. But I mean, I mean, I remember being struck just even at the end when I saw the credits, and I was like, 
oh shit, this guy did everything. Like, do, do you think sort of this style of trying to do something where you're marrying the fictional and the factual, or at least to a degree factual, in your life, like, do you think you needed sort of that time to be able to sort of let it marinate and handle it yourself rather than having a, the weight of sort of a team behind you trying to get stuff done? Well, that wasn't like my intention as far as like the personal story aspect while doing everything myself. I went right. in to like before I knew I was going to make the film myself before uh, I started making the film. So uh, I did that. Like I have multiple reasons for that. Um, one of them is because I didn't have I don't like using people unless I have something to offer them. So I didn't have any really any money to give people. But that wasn't like the main reason. Another one is that I've been. Uh, been trying to make films now for 21 years, uh, 14 years at that point when I was making it and um, or started it. And I, uh, I films move so fast and are swept under the rug and, and it's really hard for anybody to get noticed or, or, and so I wanted to make something that was as unique as I possibly could in the most unique way, in the most unique way, which is why I like doing it myself and to kind of show my worth and my value in this medium and how dedicated I am to it. So hopefully people will, will acknowledge that and, and uh, want to work with me. And that's why, like, even why the film is paced the way it is and, mm -hmm. and it's not, might not work for everybody, which is fine because like, I wanted to make something that I didn't care how commercial it was because I didn't want to make the same thing that I see all the time. Uh, I wanted to do something that would hopefully get some attention from the right the right people so that was um one of one of the big big reasons there's other ones but uh. no but it's an important one because i mean we live in such a day and age where we're drowning in content left right and center it's it's important for something like this to be able to stand out and i mean just in watching it i was struck by i mean not just the sound design but even just sort of the conscious sort of visual use of the forest and just sort of having things play in shadows and all that kind of stuff. And I mean, especially when you're a one man crew, that feels yeah. like a, a daunting thing to set up. Yeah. I mean, it was, yeah. I, um, but also like, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm pretty comfortable with, like I, I've been trying to make films for a long time and I'm very, I'm pretty comfortable with like my atmosphere and the mood and, uh, um, it was just tedious. Uh, that's mm -hmm. like, I think that's the biggest thing is it was just uh, tedious, but it didn't, it never felt daunting except for my, my grand trying to get my grandmother's stuff to work. Uh, I did have a moment of panic at one point, actually. Uh, and that's when I was building the cabin and uh, uh, it took me forever just to lay like the the foundation of the cabin was a bunch of pallets and it took me forever just to uh to uh lay one pallet down and and then i was being like oh man i have this whole cabin to build and then i have to shoot the film and then have to do this and then at that moment i was like okay i'm taking this one step at a time and uh and then after that i didn't really like uh it didn't never just it didn't feel daunting it, again it was just tedious um no, I probably, but, but I mean, it's it's a tedium that you have to sort of invest in to get the payoff yeah. because it allows yeah. for a certain visual flair and it allows for you to to sort of stand out in a in a world where it's hard to stand out. Yeah, yeah. And if you don't like, I mean, like, and again, it's the film's not for every, everybody. And if you don't like it, you can go watch go watch something else. That's fine. But if you want something that's going to be different and it's going to challenge you in in different ways. Uh, maybe just to keep your attention, um, uh, try it. And but like, yeah, and I, it was definitely, I feel like I made it, it was like a film for filmmakers. Like I wanted to, right. yeah. I really want to get out there in this world so I can make projects with other people. And, and I do want to make films that are more accessible. I'm not trying to make uh, films like this. In the, I mean, I do, I want to keep the atmosphere. I'm going to be very uh, particular about how I shoot certain far as like i'm putting my all into it um except not by myself but i do with store story elements and i i want to i want to make things that are a little bit more accessible um but i needed to start somewhere 
and I want wanted to grab the attention of people in the industry was kind of like the main the kind of like the main goal here. <laughs> well, so. and I mean the the lower the budget goes, the more sort of room you have for experimentation, which only oh, exactly. benefits yeah. you in the long run. Yes. Oh yeah. And like if you gave me one like this might not be what you're saying, but if you gave me a budget, like a two million dollar budget, uh back before I, I made this film, um, I wouldn't have been ready to do to to work with that type of money and to work with a bunch of people. And, um, but now after spending so long and, and really fine tuning every little aspect and, and, and having a lot more knowledge in every, every little aspect, uh, I feel like I could, could handle, handle that now and working sure. with a bigger team. Now, I yeah. mean, especially in this business, I always say that no matter what avenue we're working in, we always come to it as, as fans first. And I'm yeah. kind of curious from your perspective, like uh -huh. is there a movie or a moment in your youth that was the pivot point for you to go, okay, I want to, I want to make films. I want to be a storyteller. Yeah. But it wasn't, it wasn't a particular movie actually. Um, that did, that did come later. Uh, but uh, what wanted me to be a filmmaker was I was out. Uh, so I live in, Cal in Santa Cruz, California and my cut my, uh, I have cousins that live in Tucson, Arizona and we, I went out there when I was 13 years old and one of my older cousins was making a, a like a short film for a school, like a school project, a high school project. And I was like, oh, that's cool. So I went to my, uh, I would love to do that. And so I went to my younger cousin there and I was like, uh, and he was probably 12 or 11 at that time. And I was like, oh, let's, uh, you want to go make something? Let's go, let's go make something out in, in the desert. And so uh, I got a, uh, we went and gathered a bunch of props. One of them was this monkey mask, which you can actually see in Seder. It's, it's in the cabin. You can see a monkey mask hung up on the wall there. Um, and that was like the, fair, the, the little short film that I, we did, it was about an evil monkey and it was this cardboard mask and it was silly. And uh, we, it, we shot it. It was all one shot. And um, uh, we played it to with my, or I played it or screened it uh, for my family that evening and made my aunt jump. And as soon as she jumped, I'm like, that is such a cool reaction. I want to make films now for the rest of my life. Nice. And now I don't, I have no interest in doing like, jump scare movies even though this this film does have a couple of them but like uh but uh yeah so that was my my like oh i want to start making films but then yeah when when i was uh starting to look at filmmakers or realizing that there's directors behind films that was like a uh, kevin smith and and with clerks and um and robert rodriguez uh with like Desperado, like I, I wanted to make uh, action movies for the longest time. <laughs> I was, I was uh, like 14, 15 years old doing uh, sword fights and, and wire work, like, oh, nice. and um, for like high school projects. And uh, yeah, look, I mean, they're super embarrassing to look at now as far as acting goes, but like some of the action sequences that I was able to do at that age is still like, wow, that's actually kind of cool looking. Um, but uh um, yeah, so that's what I wanted to do. And then I, uh, uh, and then I wanted to start doing dramas, uh, when I became 18, 19, that's where you get kind of like into a, like a pretentious stage where it's like, oh, action movies are below me and you want to horror, be movies, and yeah, horror movies are below me and I want to do serious dramas. And then, um, uh, and then got out of that. I still, I mean, I have uh, drama. I, like I would love to adapt my grandmother's journals one day because uh, she uh, wrote with three months in 1968. I don't know if I said this on this interview, but in uh, 1968, she uh, um, came across a Ouija board and that's where she summed up Seder and then spent three months with him and ended up in a psychiatric hospital at the end of the, those three months. But she documented as a journal, like a book. She, I found, I randomly came across it while making this film. And uh, she, uh, she documented every single day with him. And uh, so I'd love to adapt that, but I would love to do that in a, in a drama type sense. Um, and then, um, but for right now I wanna stay in the, the horror 
the horror ish genre. Like I love like killing of the sacred deer. Right. And, right. Uh, so I want to stay kind of in the psychological creepy creepiness. Uh, yeah. Is there any sort of written lore for the, the, the Seder sort of entity or was this something that was purely created or thought up? Because I mean, I think that's another thing about the film, especially for me when it comes to horror movies. I love those psychological twists. I love those insidious little unsettling moments. Like, you know, if it's some monster creature reveal, then it's not always fun. But yeah. if it's you're in the woods in the middle of the dark and you see something and you hear something, that like that's what really, really gets done to your skin. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, Seder... The entity of Seder was very, very real to my grandmother. Mm. So uh, uh, her just speaking about him, I wasn't thinking about a lore so much, more about just capturing as much as I could of her speaking about it. Uh, and then trying to create my own like a uh, uh, demon or demonic or ominous or evil aspect, dark aspect later on uh, mm. the fictional aspect um yeah i wasn't i wasn't thinking so much about like the folklore or the, the lore of everything okay. now i mean just to maybe start putting a bow on this i'm kind of curious because like you said this Seder may not be a movie for everyone in horror or all the horror fans out there but it's for the people who like it they're really gonna like it and i'm kind of curious from your perspective, if you had to talk to someone who was maybe on the fence and watched the trailer and like, that looks cool, but I don't know what's going on. Like, how would you ultimately sort of describe the experience of Seder? Um, well, like it's a, it's, it's a dream. Like Variety wrote something uh, like a great quote. Um, I don't have it on me, but it was something about experiencing somebody's unsettling dream. Um, you have to allow yourself to just you're going to watch it uh try not focusing so much on the story because i don't think you'll get it the first time i don't know how anybody could get really the story the first time viewing it because it is so vague i guess but um uh i mean all the details are there but i know it'll take multiple viewings but like just go in there and just allow yourself to experience the mood and the sounds and and uh, get yourself in a weird place and just uh, enjoy the, the atmosphere and the, the feeling. Allow yourself to feel uh, dreamlike. Uh, no, and you know what? You're absolutely right because it is one of those things where you just start, sort of have to embrace the idea that you're going to be on this uneasy ground for 80 some odd minutes and then you have to wait. You just have to see where you end up. And I think that's the magic of it. And I think that's... Uh, important in filmmaking to sort of make stuff that's going to push convention and be a little different. And I think this definitely qualifies and uh, congratulations again on the film. And thanks for the time today, man. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. Sorry. That took a little bit of getting zoom getting life, myself. brother, zoom yeah. life. <laughs> yeah. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental, or purchasing needs this summer, as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and and Blu-ray needs.